Thank you and welcome back. Our final panel is our keynote panel on the pers perspectives on inclusive leadership. Our panel will be moderated by Dr. Syra Yamin. Please welcome Dr. Yamin and our distinguished panelists. Okay, all right, welcome back. Great to see you all. We have a very distinguished panel here to talk about inclusive leadership. Inclusive leadership is one of 16 DOD equities on D WPS principles. I was addressing some of you in the morning and I said, please take the time to look at the Department of Defense's Women, Peace and Security Framework. It's online. Uh, it's the uh, SFIP, the um, strate Strategic Framework and Implementation Plan, page nine, which provides a list of DOD equities and principles and inclusive leadership is one of them. We've covered quite a few in this symposium here, many topics. Uh, now, without further ado, I would like to introduce my first speaker, Rear Admiral Luis Del Carpio, who is a great friend and alumni, one of the uh, alumni of our War College, uh, the director of the Peru Naval War College. Welcome. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Doctor, also for the kindly invitation. Uh, I will start uh, my my presentation. When I was very young, midshipmen, they asked who want to be in a submarine for first time. And I was a midshipman in the fourth year, and I rose my hand. And when I was there, I remember the first diving maneuver. I was not part of the crew. I was like a, a guest. But I saw all the crew working together to dive the submarine in a synchronized dance, open and closing valves. And in that moment, I decided to be a submarine officer. Uh, after time, after the time, I began with a one stripe on board the submarines. But during my career, I recognized that not, not only on board the ships, in all the institutions, we need to work together like a clock. So I, I will use the, the analogy and the metaphor of the clock because inside a clock, you have a lot of gears. Each gear has different size. And the, the motor that drives the clock in the past was a spring. After that was a DC motor, but that is the leader that make all the things work together in a better way or in a bad way. And I think that uh, we need to understand that inside the clock, we have a lot of gears. Each gear needs teeth. The teeth are the skills that we need in each person to accomplish one task or one duty. And that is the key to maintain the clock in function. So last year I was uh, following this wonderful symposium online from Peru and Admiral Chatfield began to explain her experience in Afghanistan and her group was able to achieve some tasks and operations because she had women and men working together in his own group. Today in the morning, Lieutenant Fleming also explained that, that she was able to work and have a good contact with the population and you have male and female population in risk. So I think what, what is the necessity today to have clockmakers, leaders, clockmakers that provide inside the clock a good environment, a commitment, but the commitment comes not free because you need to have a good environment to have commitment. So I saw a lot of uh, institutions that people arrive with hope, very happy to join, but after a few years, they depart and we lost that gear. And it's very complicated to, to, to pull again that gear. 
And also, we are, I think that in the military around the world, you will uh, recognize that we, we follow the military career and we began as little years, but with the years, you increase the diameter of your career. And we have mentors and we have also examples. As young officers, we are like sponges. So we need to have leaders in different uh, ranks, good leaders, because the example is the key factor in, in one organization. So, but right now we are working together, men and women together, and we need to fix clock, clocks. We need to increase our understanding that we must work together, men and women, for the for this uh, complex world. So I think that my my advice for the young people is to understand that we are we need to work together. When you receive your ship, you receive your crew. All the people are part of your crew. And your task is not only to fire a torpedo or to destroy the enemy, it's also to create a navy for the future. So your ensign will be the commanding officer maybe in 20 years. So that is a commitment that we have as military leaders. We, we have the crew, and the crew is the future of our organization. Why the United States Navy have how many years? The United States Submarine Force, 123. No, the Peruvian Navy began with the submarines in 1911 also. Why we still have that type of institution? Because the people prepared the future generations with time, and we are here. So that is the, the good understanding that we need to fix the clocks with both gears, and also to provide for the future generations the possibility to begin the career with the understanding what we are together here to work together and to increase the skills and also to support and help the little gears to arrive like a spring or a DC motor for a, to be a good leader. Thank you. Thank you so much, Admiral Del Carpio. This wonderful clock metaphor, I think is going to stick with me. The teamwork that's required to work efficiently and effectively in the different skill sets and the clockwork that you're talking about. Thank you for your fascinating perspective. Our next distinguished speaker is joining us virtually. Uh, Ms. Andrea Goldstein is the Acting Director for Force Resiliency at the Department of the Navy. She is the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of the Navy on Integrated Prevention Efforts, leading the Department's Sexual Assault, sex Sexual Harassment, and Suicide Prevention and Response Efforts, and is the Executive Sponsor for the Department's WPS Implementation Efforts. Welcome, Andrea, and thank you for joining us today. We are looking forward to your perspective on inclusive leadership. Thank you, Dr. Yumin, and I'm so glad to be able to join you all. Um, I am also a Naval War College graduate, so I'm, I'm <laughs> happy to provide that as well. Um, just to start with uh, inclusion, I, I'm glad that I'm able to join virtually. Um, unfortunately, due to illness, I was not able to to make it this week, but uh, just the opportunity to still join is is an example. Um, I, I wanted to to share uh, a handful of of uh, leadership lessons that I've learned over the years from uh, terrific mentors and uh, people who I would say are on my personal board of advisors. And the first is that when it comes to creating an inclusive work environment, just consider how much it takes for people to show up to work every day. If uh, if we're existing in an environment where 
uh, people who have families are going to have a different experience. Uh, an example that I shared at a previous speaking engagement, if it was for me personally, if there had been an act of anti-Semitic violence over the weekend, showing up to work on Monday is going to be a lot harder. Um, and in addition, it also takes so much more for some people just to get through the workday. One of the, the common challenges that we face in, in my portfolio, particularly when it comes to issues of sexual harassment, is thinking about being an active bystander and bystander intervention. And we frequently expect people to self-advocate when something is wrong that is happening directed towards them. And that is putting a great deal of responsibility on an individual who may not necessarily feel empowered or may not feel fully safe. And so in that consideration of how much it takes people to show up every single day, um, you cannot necessarily expect people to feel comfortable self-advocating. You have to create a safe environment for that and potentially ask them if they feel comfortable with you advocating on their behalf. The second is to rethink common questions and scenarios. And I, I, I picked up on a little bit of this in the, in the previous panel, but um, some of the, when we're here talking about women, peace and security, but that also means we need to be talking about men and boys and men and masculinities and actually describing the entire um, constellation of challenges that we're facing. And uh, I'll give a couple of examples of really great reframings of uh, of common questions. So I also serve as a Navy Reserve officer, and a very common question to ask someone is if they have a family. And typically that means, do you have a spouse and do you have children? Which uh, is an incredibly unfair question to people who neither have a spouse nor children or only have one or the other, um, because it assumes that people's families uh, are, can only look one way. And there are people whose friends are their family, or they might have family who's local, but it might be a sibling, it could be parents. And so uh, a, a great leader who I worked for would ask people, do you have family who's local? As a way to get to better understand people's family dynamics. And some of it, they would talk about their partner or their spouse, their children, but they would say, oh, yes, I have a sibling who lives in town. Oh, no, my, my family lives 500 miles away. Um, and so that also starts to get at, okay, what are people's support systems? Um, another question that I thought was really great was uh, around the, the winter holidays, uh, another leader who I worked for didn't say, you know, are, who here it belongs to this religious group? It was who celebrates this holiday? And that was a really great way of 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 including everyone and, and getting to understand what people's traditions were in a way that didn't make people feel singled out. And this also gets it thinking about what other demographics we don't necessarily acknowledge. Uh, there are two, uh, in addition to race, age, gender, ethnicity, uh, religious background, that I think are often missed out, which is uh, single people who don't have children and uh, also thinking about age demographics. Um, so also thinking about who, what are these common questions, scenarios we're not looking at. And in that situation, I also think about what are your, your group dynamics and finding ways to call on everyone uh, because not everyone necessarily feels comfortable just speaking up. Some people are verbal processors. I am definitely a verbal processor. But some people need the opportunity to quietly consider and uh, will often be some of the most brilliant contributors if they have an opportunity to process and then uh, speak when, when called on, but may not necessarily speak out. And the third is to show your own vulnerability uh, and be kind. Uh, we don't necessarily always talk about vulnerability and kindness as leadership characteristics, but they absolutely are. Um, it, it, a big component of my portfolio here at the Department of the Navy is thinking about people's well-being and mental health and resilience. <laughs> it's in the title. But as leaders, we cannot expect people to do things that we would not do ourselves. 
and showing humanity and showing kindness and showing that you care creates an environment where people feel much more willing and able to be themselves. And so uh, those there were so to to sum up, there were three points. One is consider how much it takes for people to show up every day. Rethink common questions and scenarios. And show your own vulnerability and be kind. And I'm looking forward to the rest of this panel. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughtfulness, your wisdom. You made me think about some of the people I work with and have in the past. And who are the people who made me feel most included? And leadership, we all know, is action is not position. And if someone makes me feel included by their words, by their statements, by how they engage with me, they are leaders. I'm going to give some thought to your words tonight, Andrea, about the people who made me feel included. And I'm going to think about how I'm going to make others feel included. So thank you so much. Our next speaker is Ambassador Eric Nelson. He joins us. Um, he's come from Germany. He's the Associate Director at uh, the Marshall Center, one of DOD's six regional centers on security studies. He, uh, Ambassador Nelson is outstanding in his efforts because he is now trying to prioritize WPS programming at the Marshall Center. And um, I would like to hear from him about his perspectives on inclusive leadership. Over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Syrah, for the opportunity. And I, I feel humbled to be invited to, to be on this panel because um, um, I've been at this for a while, and um, but I'm always learning, and I've been tremendously grateful for this opportunity to, to attend a symposium because I've learned a lot about what it takes to to build, um, inc yet more about what it takes to build inclusive leadership and to advance women, peace, and security. Um, and I'd want to share some of the things I've written down, um, and I highly recommend. Um, if you didn't see the one of the first panels this morning, James Minnick from the um, Asia Pacific um, Security Studies Center has a wonderful presentation. It'll be online um, because I found his descriptions of diversity, inclusion and belonging as as very powerful, um, especially when we, we we talk about. Unfortunately, diverse inclusion has now even become controversial about um because too often we address this as a zero sum game. If somebody's given, if somebody else is, if somebody's new included, then that must, must mean somebody else is excluded. And that is not at all what it's about. Um, but he defines it belonging as an environment where barriers are removed, where all feel valued, where divergent opinions are respected, and where people do not re reform to be accepted. Um, and I don't know about you, but in my few days here at, at the Navy War College and in my conversations with, with many of the students, this seems like a great place of belonging. I feel like I belong and I salute Admiral Chatfield for building a, a very, uh, an institution that makes people feel belonging. I'm going to pause for applause if you agree. I, I'm also uh, struck that, you know, we talked a lot about what's missing in our capacity to achieve real progress. And we hear a lot about how we need new re resources. We need trained people. We need gender advisors. We need new programs. We need appropriations. Um, we, I think more importantly, need to just uh, order our priorities to make sure that whatever resources we have we're including prioritization of, of, of inclusion, especially of inclusion of women, to create effective teams and to accomplish our missions. Because the failure to include women, the, the, the failure to include any group, produces a, a team that is not robust and is not weak. And every leader knows that they need to surround themselves with a diverse team that you need various viewpoints 
and you need to build a team where hopefully you're if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in trouble. You need a smart team around you with many different opinions advising you. And you need to be aware of what your deficits are and what your blind spots are and, and try to build a team and encourage a team and create space for that team to have their voice and to express their opinions and express express their doubts. Um, I think it's important to also recognize and always emphasize that leadership in an organization must occur from all levels. In, of course, in the, in the foreign service, we evaluate performance. Leadership is a precept for all employees from junior to senior. But we have to, as leaders, create opportunities for young, for new, for, uh, uh, the the whole range of employees to have leadership opportunities. So uh, one approach I've taken is when we need, for example, a working group, we have an initiative at the embassy. I look for the the um, the junior and mid level employees who should be leading that effort, and then making sure that they have good executive support. But that working group is chaired by the working level. Um, that is really best informed about the problem and trying to build a solution. And then that's a great opportunity for, for you to coach them and, and help them exceed in advancing change. But no, no employee should feel like they can't lead from whatever rank they're at. And it's important for leaders to um, create those avenues where, where they have that, that, that opportunity. Um, oh, and there are tools, I think, that, that can help you. I've used the Gallup's uh, Strength Finder, which um, is a short test that you can take, and it assesses for some, I think, 40, 42 strengths that are required on a team. And not every team requires all 40 strengths, but when you get your team to take this, everyone ends up with five strengths, and then you can create a nice matrix and look at how, how are we together covering all of the strengths that are required. Who's the, the best collaborator? Who's the most... Um, uh, who's the better communicator? Um, who's the, who are the activists? Who are the deliberators? Um, who are the detail people? So, because if you have, of course, you don't need every strength for every task, but if you find your team is heavy, very heavy on one strength, um, that actually can, can, can be a weakness. Um, I also want to say that I approach this, um, from a personal, experience in that, uh, you know, inclusion is essential. When I joined the Foreign Service, um, my colleagues were being um, denied security clearances for their sexual orientation. So in my second year in the Foreign Service, I became an officer in, uh, we established an association called Gl uh, GLIFA, Gays and Lesbians and Foreign Affairs Associ Association because we were being denied um, security clearances as if our sexual orientation was, was suspect. Um, and we, it, it was difficult. Um, a lot of people didn't want to join. They were afraid. Um, but it took especially younger people like me who felt I had nothing to lose. Um, but I can't go through a career and not be authentic and not be myself and not have, have my partner recognized. Um, but our progress, we would have had no progress if we hadn't had allies. So as we advocated for, for the gaps and for the, the discrimination that we, against the discrimination that we were experiencing, change had to come from the current leadership. And it did. It, it came rather quickly from diplomatic security that they realized this was, this policy was out of whack. Um, it took, um, much longer for our families to be included, um, even, but it, it took a leader like a, a secretary to recognize that she had the authority to um, support families, whether you're married or not. Um, and, and that was important because she looked at this, how do we include? Because otherwise there was high attrition and um, families who couldn't even get immunizations overseas. So. Um, that was important, but I, I mentioned that because, um, um, and, and James, uh, talk gets at this especially well. It's about allies. Allies are necessary for, um, advancing 
inclusive leadership and um, women, peace and security. It cannot wait for women to rise to, to, to senior ranks and become the leaders of this initiative. It takes men and everyone to realize that this is essential to effective security, to an effective organization, to, uh, ed to become an advocate and champion for change and progress. Thank you. Ambassador Nelson, that was very powerful. Thank you for your very candid remarks. Again, a lot of fruit of thought. The role all of us have, we are all leaders in this room, and all of us must play a role in building others as leaders and being allies for others. We're all in it together. We need to build inclusive teams, and we need to look out for those groups that are different. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. All right. Now, uh, our next guest, I'm very excited to introduce a non-government perspective from Ms. Catherine Kitty Pilgrim. Uh, some of you know her, may know her. Uh, she has holds true celebrity status. She is an award-winning broadcast journalist, foreign policy expert, and thought leader on how media shapes global affairs in an increasingly interconnected world. A pioneer in cable news, she played a key role in helping build CNN into a global news power powerhouse through her work as a correspondent and actor. I could read on and on, but you have her bio. Uh, so without further ado, over to you, Kitty. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I must say, I'd rather just join their teams. They're so amazing. Um, very good speeches. And I hope I'm not being redundant in any respect. So thank you for inviting me. Um, it is a great pleasure to join this symposium and be in the excellent company of these panelists. I've been really, truly inspired by some of the presentations and the scholarship at the Naval War College. I'm going to be talking about advancing women through leadership. And my background, as Sarah mentioned, is in media, foreign policy, very strong emphasis on international security. Leadership is a really important topic for me. Um, I've had a long road, and I won't bore you with the stories. I'll just move on to leadership. Um, one doesn't do any better than Eleanor Roosevelt when it comes to women's leadership. So I'll start with a quote from my absolute favorite first lady. A good leader inspires people to have confidence in the leader. A great leader inspires people to have confidence in themselves. So in the spirit of that quote, I'd like to suggest the following. To inspire confidence in ourselves. And I believe there are several behaviors that women can adopt to self-empower. And let me say right up front that women have always found a way to shine despite some of the societal restrictions that have been placed on them in the past. And I suggest this only as a refresher on behaviors that we already know. And these practices, if shared with younger colleagues, might allow women to begin to level the playing field and move into positions of influence. So number one, is support others, promote their success. We've talked at this conference about mentorship and allyship. Corporations invest millions of dollars in fostering teamwork in their work environments. The military has always seen the benefits of individuals supporting one another. Teamwork is a prescription for success in the battlefield and in the boardroom. And society as a whole benefits from this kind of collaborative effort. No permission is required to take this action. Women can begin to support each other on their own volition. Number two, understand the world we live in. Information is power, and I very strongly believe in this. One of the great benefits of our current age is we're in an information revolution. We have access to vast amounts of information at our fingertips. There is no barrier to entry here. Information is available to all. Media is ubiquitous. The choices are yours to make. Now, I have spent almost 30 years in media. My personal advice is to choose very carefully. Sources must be checked. 
Information consumption of media is critical these days, and now more than ever, consumers of media should use critical thinking. This is not a passive occupation. Scrolling should not be a passive op occupation. So consumer beware. And, and you're hearing this from me, get off the screen. Listen to others in person. Part of understanding the world we live in is to engage with other people, and hopefully people who are nothing like you in terms of societal background, experience, or gender. Talk to people. A great leader listens carefully to others and understands the times in which they live. So be a great leader. Number three, be part of the solution. A great deal of talk about women's empowerment involves the word agency. A woman has to have agency in her world to change her fate, to determine her future, to realize her potential. Agency is something a woman, a woman can give to herself. So many women are empowering themselves today. I am so impressed. Smarting, sm starting small businesses, founding a charity, running a food bank, volunteering in their community, running for office. It's something my grandmother would call the can-do spirit. Once a habit of giving oneself's agency is adopted, it becomes self-perpetuating and will spill over into other aspects of your life. Number four, using power and influence for societal change. We are living in difficult times. The inequities in society are glaring. We must address this. And as women, we understand the burdens of family, the home, the daily budgets, the struggles. We must advocate for societal change to make prosperity within the reach of all people. Number five, take a stand. This is a risky proposition. It requires asserting a viewpoint when it is not always comfortable. We now live in a world where standing up for what one believes is important. Ours is a confusing world. The noise of the media, social media, it can be very polarizing and even disorienting. It is increasingly important to reflect on our values, stand up for what one believes and live life according to a personal code of excellence. Women can empower themselves to do this. It requires no permission. Take a stand. We live in a free society. Taking a stand is our right. It is important to find our voices. In closing, I have a personal anecdote. There was a young woman who worked in my office who was admitted to a very important policy organization. And frankly, I was absolutely thrilled she was invited to be a member. What an honor for her. And the way this organization worked was a speaker would present a policy paper and then people would ask questions. Well, when this young woman would come back from the meetings to my office and talk about all the interesting things she learned and all the interesting things that were said, I would always listen and I would pause. And then I would say, did you ask a question? Meaning, did she have enough nerve to stand up and make herself known to the group? During Q&A, did she actually stand up and speak? She always had to say no. Every time I would ask, did you ask a question? Both she and I knew that a seat at the table was not enough. She hadn't really arrived yet until her voice was heard. Yes, she had the visibility. She was there at the table. She had the credibility. She was invited because of her own accomplishments, but she didn't have the voice. Visibility is great, but women need voice. Showing up and being visible is not enough. Voice, this is something we give ourselves. And she wasn't giving it to herself. Well, needless to say, she found her voice. Eventually, she asked a question. But this is where leadership comes in. It's not enough to promote young women. One must take stock of their progress and not be afraid to challenge them. Did you ask a question? That simple, non judgmental statement and her answer told me everything. Women have to ask the question. It starts as a process. A young woman will find her voice and her viewpoints. A leader tells her that being visible is not enough. Her voice and viewpoint are valued. 
if we pull the young women and men out of the corners and ask their opinion and make them understand that their views are valuable, inch by inch, women will step forward. Women will engage. Women will lead. And that is leadership. And now I invite you to ask a question. <laughs> So just to sum it up, before I open it up, Kitty, you made me think about the notion that leadership is about changing the world. Leadership is about accepting responsibility. But most of all, leadership is about becoming a better individual, a more committed individual, and becoming a better person, being supportive of others, being collaborative, becoming a better listener. Sounds simple, but it's not. We have to put in a lot of hard work. So thank you for that. And now I open it up for questions. Thank you. <laughs> 